is down there, and now we can start the regular one. Hey. <laughs> I was laughing over there because can you hear me? I was yelling, can, can you hear himself? Yeah. We all love that, don't we? Amen. Amen. Or my nickname for him, Moses. <laughs> you know, he's, he's Moses to me. Someone put, I know, I got it. I got it. I remember how to do that. Sheesh. Yeah, children's Church and Pastor Maine and your group. Make sure you guys at the barbecue. I want you guys there, man. Amen. You guys are dismissed. I also want to be to remind you, if you didn't see it on the announcements, is uh, we're Donna wants to get everybody together who's going to be involved in the nativity just for a real brief meeting after church. We just want to make sure that all those who signed up for nativity are going to be part of it so that we can go further with planning. Okay. Um, Pastor, what kind of nativity is that? Pardon me? Is it the one for the Christmas or? Yes. Oh, okay. It's live nativity. Yep. You should be there at that meeting. All right. How many read chapter 11? I was out, I was out last week, uh, so nobody shared with us, but uh, we're back on chapter 11. Uh, we're going to finish up next week with Daniel chapter 12, but we've gone through the first 10 chapters. And my last time speaking with you was uh, where Daniel was concerned with, with his people because they were heading back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and he started getting these visions from the angels and telling them what was going to be happening, and so he decided that best thing he could do is fast and pray for 21 days. And so I encourage the church to fast and pray on behalf of your church and the needs of your church for, for 21 days. And we're on our, we're on our sec, starting our second week here. So I've been praying for those who are fasting and that, that God gets, uh, that you draw closer to him and that he answers those questions and those needs in your life that are so, that, that, are, that are important to you. I think sometimes God wants us to, to see in our lives how important things are to us. You know, if we really believe what we're, what we're saying. And I, I in, my, in my studies this week at school, you know, we're studying Christian ethics. And it's so, it's so interesting because we say so much. We read so much. But that really makes really no difference unless it's showing somewhere outside of it. I just want you to think just a moment right now, is when's the last time you spoke to somebody that didn't know Christ about Christ? And that's the commandment. That's the one. That's, that's the job. That's why God made us in his image so we could go and do that. And so I had to check my life. Am I doing that? Am I talking to the people that God's placed in my life? My family, some of, some of them are, some of them are in, in, in my family. Some of them are friends, some of them are neighbors, as you know. But uh, I've been trying a lot harder to do more of that. And to just speak truthfully about what God's done. It's not hard. Some of you know, I can't do that, I don't know. I don't know all the Bible. I'm telling you, I don't know all the Bible. I don't think anybody here knows all the Bible. Some of you are close. Mr. Hales, he's, he's probably the closest. He's probably right behind him. Okay? But they still don't know it all. You can mess them up on a couple things. <laughs> so just share your heart. Share what God has placed on your heart and what he's done for you. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Well, getting back to Daniel chapter 11, because Bud was talking about the end times. And the end times are near. And that's kind of what Daniel's leading up to here. And it's interesting because God chose Daniel because he could... He was respected and he knew that he would follow what he asked him to do. And that he was a man of prayer and a man of, of reverence to God, a man pursuing God. And so that's why he, he chose Daniel. And Daniel 11 is an amazing chapter. How many read Daniel 11 again? Can you guys talk about that? Again, it's an amazing chapter. And, it, and, it, and it, it really details some of the history of the world, but also some of the stuff that's coming in front of us. And there's many commentators. You know, the more you read commenta commentaries, the more you get confused, I think. You know, I try, to, I try to, you know, limit myself there. I do have to go there for some things, but it's like, man, what is, 
What, what I want is what God wants. What is God telling me? You know, not what this comment, this, 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 this theologian or that theologian. What is God telling me? But sometimes you need to look at those to get some understanding of what God's telling you. And that's kind of where I'm at in, 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 in Daniel chapter 11. And I, I tried to shorten it. Uh, Don know, knows my pain in trying to shorten this, this message. And I've I, I stayed up late at night a couple of nights this week trying to shorten it. And, uh, no, I didn't get it too short, so hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but I think God's good, though. He's going to get us through this, okay? Amen. Well, the first verse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with you guys. Are like, this is good, Pastor. Verse 1 through 35 were prophecy for Daniel, but it's history to us. Okay. See how fast we went through 35 verses? Boom. Just like that. And these verses contain over 100 specific predictions that have already been fulfilled. And all the way through Daniel, we've seen how, how when God predicts things, or things are prophesied through God, that they don't just happen around when he thought they were supposed to happen. They were spot on when they were supposed to happen. So we're talking over 100 specific predictions that have already been fulfilled. So if I'm thinking he's 100 for 100, I think 101 is going to come true Okay, when he says it is. But this first 35 chapters mostly describes war and intrigue in the Greek Empire, empire following the death of Alexander the Great. We've been following these kings all the way through, the, all the way through these chapters. And verse 23 through 21 through 35 describes the actions of the, 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 the compatible person. We know from history that Ant Ant Antiochus IV, this guy was terrible. This guy was terrible. And when we read this, this 11th chapter, in this last part, the 36 through 45, many people believe that this is written about him. I think it is, but it's also written about what's in store for us. And and his atrociousness against the Jews are also, we talked about in Daniel 8. We already went through some of that stuff already. So beginning in verse 36, we come to a section that is, was prophecy to Daniel, and I think it's still a prophecy to us today for the reasons I just, I just stated in the past. And since the early days of Christian church, most people have seen in these verses the description of the final end-time ruler known as the so we believe, that I'm, I'm, I'm leaning toward that's what these, these passages are talking about. They may be talking about that king, but you know what? It's, it's our end times. It's a cycle of things. I think it's the things that are, that, are, that are in front of us. And you know, when you start looking at the Antichrist, you know what, think, just think in your own mind, what comes to your mind when you hear that word, Antichrist? And who is he? And before we go any further, I think we need to lay some foundations about about what, what it means uh, and what the term Antichrist is really, is really all about. And the Antichrist is a man who will appear on the world scene in the last days, just before the return of Jesus Christ here on earth. And he's described both in the Old and the New Testaments. And he, he is evil, but he's described and he's, he's, he's uh, disguised as this dynamic, this charismatic, visionary leader. And so we're, we're, a lot of people are going to be fooled by this person. That's right. And his empire will span every continent, and his rule will be the most demonic individual the world has ever experienced. Many people are going to get caught. Right. But as we, as, as our theme for Daniel has been all the way through this book, our theme has been heaven rules and God wins. I was so excited to hear that Wednesday night. Someone said, yeah, Pastor, God wins. Jesus, because he does. We need to remember that. And as I shared with you before, you know, many times I, I uh, the best illustration I have for it is many times I, I record sports games. And I say to myself, I'm not going to watch it. But I'll look at my phone and I'll see the score. And when my team wins, right, I'll watch the game with a lot more peace and a lot more comfort and joy knowing, you know, they had three turnovers, they gave the ball up, people were touched that guy got hurt, but you know what? What I do know, because I looked at the score, when I get to the end of watching that game, I know my team won. And that's what God is doing for us through Daniel. 
So no matter how bleak, no matter how bad it might look, no matter how, how weird it might seem or things you have to go through, at the end of the tape, heaven rules and God wins. Amen. And all you got to do is, is be on God's team. He will rise to world domination, declaring himself a man of peace. But later, he's going to take the world into some huge global war. And eventually, I think his true character will be revealed to us. And he will, he will be opposed to Jesus Christ and then offer himself as the Savior of the world. Who's going to do that to you? And most of the world, unfortunately, will be willing to follow him. And those who do not receive the mark will be hunted down and many will be killed because of it. And for a short period of time, he will become the most powerful man on earth. In this battle that's going to happen, this apex of his power, he will launch an all-out attack on Jesus Christ in a place called Megiddo in the valley of Jezreel in the central region of Israel. And I'm going to explain what, why, why I say that. And that battle is known in the Bible as Armageddon. It's going to happen. Not sure where we're going to be in all this, but it's going to happen. And his reign of terror is going to come, is going to come suddenly when he's destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ as he returns to earth to set up the kingdom. See, it, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be quick. It's not going to be a long battle. It's going to be quick. He's going to take care of it quick. And the Bible says that the number of his name of the Antichrist is 666. How many have heard about that? And throughout history, there have been many attempts to explain this number. I think most have failed. And we can say two things about its certainty. Since seven is the number of divine perfection, 666 represents Satan's attempt to counterfeit God. Okay. 666 stands for the best man can do. Think about that. Would you want the best man can do, or would you want the perfection of God? God. Which would you want? <laughs> I just said, I'm talking to Barbara this morning, and we were talking about, man, if God wasn't with us, where would we be? And I looked at her and go, I can just imagine how this service would go if God wasn't in here. We'd be a mess here. I know I, I would. And you probably wouldn't be here because you couldn't, what, what's this guy doing? <laughs> and he'll be the true antichrist, both against him and in a place, in a place of him. And that number will be understood by those living in the day. In Revelation 13, 18, it says, this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast for his man's number. You guys all remember back in the year 2000? Everybody was worried it was doomsday, 2000, the world was going to end. You know, we all got our we churches were packed that year, and everything was pretty much like, you know, zeroing in on, the, on that time. The world's ending, you know, the computer's going to go all cool. I mean, every, how many different weird things were come up with, man? Which, which well, I want to tell you, none of that was in here. Okay? That was over here somewhere, which a lot of us. Grabbed onto. You know? None of that baloney was in here. Right. If you want to find out the truth of what's going to be happening, this is where it's. I mean, he's, God's pretty good. Amen. Actually, more than he's perfect. Right. And so, in 2000, Newsweek magazine reported a poll and they conducted by the Princeton Survey Research. And it said when Americans of all religions and those having no religions were asked this question, do you believe that the world will end, as the Bible predicts, in the battle of Armageddon between Jesus and the Antichrist? 40% answered yes, and 42% answered no. Of those who answered yes, the following question was asked. Do you believe the Antichrist is on earth now? Yes. Answer, 47% yes, and 31% no, and 22% don't know. And so I, I thought, man, that's an interesting little... little uh, Survey there. So who does the world think was or is or could have been the Antichrist? So I had a little fun. I, I Googled just to find out to see what the world was thinking here. Here's some of the one names that came up. Roman Empire Nero. The Pope, each and every one of them. <laughs> Napoleon, remember Napoleon? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Adolf Hitler. John F. Kennedy. Henry Kissinger. Ronald Reagan, Mikhail Gorbachev, Saddam Hussein, and now his later son, his son, Uday Hussein, Sun Myung Moon, Yasser Arafat, Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, richest man, yeah. George W. Bush, here's the craziest one I got, and this was actually in there, Barney the Dinosaur. <laughs> Now, 
Not a serious suggestion, he said, but there are several websites devoted to the idea that has something to do with the dragon of, the, of Revelation. See, how silly is the world? And we get <coughs> sucked into it. Why do we do that? And as the, when, when the end times come, we're going to get sucked into that stuff. And that's why it's so important right now to stay in the Word, stay in prayer, stay as close as you can to God because you need Him. You need His protection. You can't waver. It's close. And the only thing we know for sure is that every guess so far has been wrong. That's all we know. And by definition, we can't know in advance who the Antichrist will be because, because we'll not appear to be evil at first. And that's the thing. He's not going to appear to be evil at first. It's not as if he's going to go around running for office with a slogan saying, I'm the Antichrist. <laughs> and all this is kind of fun to look at, isn't it? But you know what? where our focus needs to be? Our focus should be on Jesus. Right. It should be on him and him only. And if we keep our eyes on him, we don't get fooled by all the other stuff. And I think it's going to be something like a magician. You know, if you ever, you ever try to watch magicians, you, you try to keep your eye on him, focused on him, so you can find out what the trick is. I mean, we need to be spot on focused Amen. on Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about everybody. <laughs> I don't care if you've known him and he's your savior and you've been doing all you can do for him and you're, you think you're right on, you still need to be zeroed in. That's right. That's right. Maybe you've fallen away. You're okay. You're just as close as we are. We just ask him to come into your life again. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're so far away you don't even know him. You can be that close too this morning. Because mm -hmm. time is near. It's close. And Daniel talks in this passage about, about his... The Antichrist's character, his career, and his ultimate collapse. I'm going to share that with you this morning so we can understand and be aware of what are some things that are going to be happening and to open our eyes to it so we're, we're smart to it. We know. You know, it's like scouting the, 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 the enemy, scouting your team, the team that you're going to be playing. It's like making sure you know who's coming on. Don't tell me that the, the Giants know who the who the Royals are going to bring in from the bullpen. They know exactly the pitches he's pitching. They're not going to go up there and just swing crazy. And we need to be aware of that too. So this morning, let's look at this. So open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. And we're going to start at verse 36 this morning. And work through verse 39, just, just to begin with. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in your pew. Daniel's toward the end of the, of the Old Testament. I'll give you a second to find that. Daniel chapter 11. Verse 36 to 39. And, and these verses tell us a number of important facts about what kind of man the Antichrist will be. And how many things you can pull out of just these words of what, what we're up against and who's coming to the world to, to try to take us away. It says, The king will do, starting verse 36, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will say, Unheard of things against her God of gods, or against the God of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers for, for, the one de or, or for the one desired by women. You know, I read that over and over. And I kept thinking, why, why is that placed? For the, it says the God of his fathers or the one desired by women. And I kept thinking, of it. why is that there? What's it got to do with anything? And I begin to think more on that. And look at homosexuals today. Look at the rights, gay marriages. Don't tell me that evil is not in this world already. Because this guy doesn't desire women. You know, I don't know if that's what it means, but man, it sure it showed me that we're in the end times. Some stuff's going on here. He goes on to say, not will he not, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god of unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. 
He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. He will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make the, them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. This guy is arrogant, he's self-willed, never stops talking and boasting about himself. And in Daniel 7, we found out, right? He was the little horn, remember? Who makes big boasts about himself. And the Antichrist is going to be the ultimate egomaniac. I mean, just all about him. Look at the world today. Where does the world point to today? To ourselves, not to the living God, the creator of the universe. He's going to be deceptive, ruthless, outspoken in public opposition to God. He will initially be, be successful. We need to watch out for that. But here's where we here's where we, where, where we need to understand and, and hold on to is his reign is limited by God. Did you hear me? His reign is limited by God. The time of wrath in verse 36 refers to the last half of the seven-year tribulation period, which we've already studied. Note that even though the Antichrist has enormous power, he can only do what God permits him to do. We win. Heaven rules. God's in control. Amen. Don't think God's out of control here. He's in control. He'll set himself apart. There's no regard for the desire of women. He worships the military might. Look at verse 38. He mentions a God of fortresses. It's the only time this expression occurs in the Bible. His bloodthirsty character allows him to ruthlessly kill millions of people in, dry, in, in his drive for world domination. He doesn't care. He will conquer many nations. He will richly reward those who follow him, though. And for a short two period of time there, it would appear that, the, that, that he's the savior of the world, that, that, that everybody's yearning for. But the man of peace will soon reveal his true character. So let's look at his career. That's his character. Let's look at his career. In verse 40 through 44, continuing on. At the time of the end of the king, at the, at the time of the end of the king of the south, will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and a cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of of uh, Ammon will be delivered from, the, from his hand. He will extend his power over, the, over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and, and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out a great rage to destroy and, and annihilate, annihilate many. Wow. See, these verses describe a series of military maneuvers that are going to be happening and are taking place during the last few years of the tribulation. That's a compressed version of what's going to be going on. And keep in mind here, Daniel's geography, so we understand where, where this can be placed at, is figured from Jerusalem as the starting point, that's the king of the south, it refers to the end time ruler who leads the alliance of armies that include present day Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and northern Africa nations. The king of the north could come from Syria, Turkey, Russia, or one of those regions. As the Antichrist tries to consolidate his power, he will face serious opposition. In this process, he invades and conquers Israel, and that's the beautiful land. And toward the end of the tribulation, he will, he will have rumors from the east, which would include Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, India, and all of Southeast Asia, China, Korea, Japan. And perhaps this is this should be connected with the vast army from the east mentioned in Revelation in chapter 16, if you want to read some of that. See, these verses give us a compressed account of what might, what we might call Armageddon and the campaign, the campaign there, the, the battle at, 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 our, at our end times. And what's referred to as a battle of Armageddon is really a military campaign involving many armies, many battles, and hundreds of millions of soldiers. And the various battles will rage over a vast area of land and sea, but will center in the Middle East. Armies from the north and the, and the east, roughly Russia and China, will move against the Antichrist, causing a bloodbath previously unknown in human history. Revelation 14 describes how bad it's going to be. It says, blood flowing as high as a horse's bridle, a stream that 
place would be four or five feet deep. As Biden's armies on Earth converge on Israel, the stage is now set for the final act of human history. So see how the story is setting up. And these are things that are becoming in front, in front of us. But remember, heaven rules and God wins. So let's read about his collapse in verse 45. In verse 45, he says, He will, he will pitch a royal, his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountains. It will come to his end. Amen? And no one will help him. So as he prepares to go to war, he sets up his military headquarters near Jerusalem, the beautiful holy mountain, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. The final battle will take place in the plains of Jezreel in central Israel, near a crossroads called Megiddo. Visitors to that area can see formed, mountains formed across centuries by successive settlements built one on top of it. That's how the mountains got. Settlements built one on top of each other built those, built those mountains there. And the Hebrew word for mountain of Megiddo is Har-Megiddo. What's that sound like to you? Which means in English, Armageddon. That's how we get that. But in verse 45 tells us nothing about how the Antichrist will be defeated, though, does it? Eventually, his end will be sudden, swift, and unexpected. And this fits with the picture given in our other passages that we studied in Daniel. We've, we've seen how God reacts to these things. Remember the rock that hit the statue in Daniel 2? The court that passes judgment in Daniel 7? The end that comes without human power in Daniel 8, and the end of the creed in Daniel 9. All these things happen suddenly. And Daniel 7 11 adds this important fact that after the little horn, who is the Antichrist, is judged, he is cast into the blazing flames. 2 Thessalonians 2 8 describes the final end of the Antichrist this way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. And the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me just ponder that a moment of that battle and all that's going on. In, in just the vastness of it. And Jesus Christ, he comes out of the heavens and it's just, it's done. He takes care of it. Immediately. Done with. The Apostle John gives us vivid descriptions of this moment. Move back over into your Bible, Revelation chapter 19. As he gives us a description of this in chapter 19, verse 11 through 14. As I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes wear. His eyes are like blazing fire, and out of his head are many crowns. And his, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a, in a robe dipped in blood and his name in the word of God. The armies of the heaven were following him, riding on the white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Move down to verse 19. Then I saw the beast of the king of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and, and, and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped the image. The two of them were thrown alive into the lake, the fiery lake of burning sulfur. I mean, the message is clear, isn't it? You can't take God on and win. I think sometimes we try to do that in our life. I, 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 can, I can do without Him. You're going to lose. No, I'm strong enough. I can do this. I don't need God. I'm young enough. I'm, I'm unbeatable. I can do this. No. You can't. Oh, I got all this money in my bank. I'm doing good. I got a nice car. I don't need Him. You do. Oh, my relationship's going real good with my wife, with my family, everything's going good. You need them. Amen. You're gonna lose. You can't, you can't, don't think you're gonna win. Don't think you're sitting there this morning going, you know what, that's all good and fine, Pastor. I understand it all, but you know what? I'm doing okay right now. Yeah, I live pretty comfortably. I 
hold a little bit, I'm able to pay my bills, I'm getting by okay, and family's doing pretty good. I got a job, a lot of people don't have jobs. I'm, you know, I'm coming to church, I'm doing pretty good. But you're relying on yourself. You can't win without God. Right? You just flat right. out cannot. And most of us, what we do is we 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 go through the, these trials and tribulations in our in our, in our in our in our lifetimes, and and we live like unbelievers. Why should we live like unbelievers? Let's live like 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 we we worship a living God. You know, my toe was killing me when I came in here this morning. <laughs> I'm telling you, my toe is killing me. I don't even feel my toe now. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because I know he wins. And I know he wants this. He doesn't want my toe to interfere with you guys. And my prayer this morning was, anything, Lord, that separates me from you, get rid of it so I can be close to you. So just survey your life for a second right now. What in your life is separating you from God? Because if anything in your life right now is separated from you from him, you from him, you lose. And I'm being blunt because end times are just coming soon. Right. And I don't want you to sit back with Pastor, you never told me about that. You didn't tell me I would have done it. We're even recording it so you can watch it again. Or I can say, yes, I did. Let's watch and see. Thank you, Jesus, for video. You can't fight him. One, a wise man once said, your arms are too short to box with God. That's right. You can't do it. The only way to be on the winning side is to be on God's side. Every other side is a loser. That's right. Your mark isn't 666. It's a big old giant L on your forehead. That's what it is. Because you're a loser. Jesus has never lost. Undefeated. But I'd love to say it by USC. That hasn't happened. I want to say it by UCLA. It hasn't happened. That's why when you say this bad, I always refer to Jesus real quick because he's never lost. That's right. But you know what? We laugh about those things, but don't we all love to be on winning teams? Yeah, man. And once you give it up this morning and join the winning team, go all in. Put the uniform on. Put standing on the sidelines. Quit hiding from the coach and asking you to go on the, on, on the playing field. Yeah. Go. Listen. So how should all this stuff we talked about? You know, there's there's, there's three three questions that I, that I had about this. Is the Antichrist alive today? I don't know. Does it matter? I don't think it even matters. If he is alive today, does he know that he is the Antichrist? Probably, probably not. He's probably somebody who everybody likes. I don't know. But I think the important question for us this morning is how should all of us be affected by what we heard today? What do we do with all this stuff that we heard? How should we respond to the truth about the coming Antichrist? Because he is coming. That's true. That's written there. He is coming. Well, first thing, brace yourself. Okay? You know the story now. You know he's coming. Brace yourself. The worst is yet to come. No matter how it may seem to be in terms of technology, the moral compass is pointing to evil. Just look at technology, how that has distorted life. People don't even talk to each other anymore. I even caught myself the other day texting with in the other room because I wanted to do something. I wanted to get on the couch. All this text, that's easier to do. That's why I'm walking on Friday nights. But how many of us do those kind of things? How many of us walked over to somebody, looked in their eyes, and talked to them? We don't know how to do even. And don't say, "Well, I'm, all of us do it." We're all in this technical revolution. We all do it. That's evilness. God didn't create us like that. God created us to be in fellowship with each other, Amen. touching each other, holding each other's hands, praying for each other, doing things together, not all sitting around in a circle. <laughs> I challenge you to 
do what my son did to me once. We were talking about this, and we had a party, and he, he told me, okay, Dad, if you think you're so good, let's all put our phones in the middle of the table. That's what he does with his friends. <laughs> and, if it, and you can't answer it. First one that answers it, has got to pay. <laughs> That's harder than what you think. Especially when your phone buzzes or beeps or something, or that special ringer you have, that special person. <laughs> If you're doing more than that than talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, you're really not following what God made you for. And that's only one way to learn. Okay? But brace yourself. Next thing, be alert. The last days are going to be confusing. They're going to be, they're going to be we're easily be sucked into these different things that are coming, coming our way. Be alert about it. Know about it. Don't let it get you. Don't get caught by it. Next one, be bold. I'm trying this one really hard, but there's no time for compromise anymore. There is no time for it. None. Zero. Zilch. Whatever other word you can put for that. We cannot compromise. The persecution is going to grow. It's going to get worse. We get ridiculed more for our faith. People are going to leave church. Did you hear that? People are going to leave church. People we thought would never leave church are going to leave. Next one, be encouraged. The Antichrist will rise and fall, and then Christ will return to set up his kingdom on this earth. And even the Antichrist is an instrument of God's hand, and he can do nothing without God's permission. When his time on earth is up, he will truly be utterly destroyed. Heaven rules, God rules. And probably the one thing, if you heard anything of what I said, what God spoke to you about this morning, if you get anything out of it this morning, this is the one most important element of what, how you can respond to what God is telling you this morning. And number five, come to Christ. Yes. Come to Him. No matter where you're at, no matter where in your life, come to Him. There's never been a better day to become a Christian. Never been a better day to, to come back to Him. Never been a better day to, to, to just, just to come to Him and just to, to solidify it. To, to, God, I just want you to know that I love you and I, I'm, I'm there. You know, there's a, there, today's that day for you. Eventually, the whole world will have to make that choice. Christ or the Antichrist. You might not come to Christ today and know you're on the way. Not having to worry. You're going to go through all that same junk, but you're not. We have peace. It's different. You're living different. Right? You're you're of the, you're in the world, but not of it. That's right. And that's how we need to live. I heard a story. There's a young woman who went to church her entire life, and she became a atheist. I mean, she grew up in the church, Sunday school, children's church, youth group, the whole thing. And she ended up becoming an atheist. And then became an agnostic. And when Christian would witness to her, she was not interested in coming to Christ. She says, no, I'm not, 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 not interested. And those ones have friends like this. And one day she had a friend who posed a simple question. And this question, this one little question, changed her entire life. And the question she had for her was, isn't Jesus enough for you? Amen. Isn't Jesus enough for you this morning? What more would you want? Isn't Jesus enough for you? And she thought about it. She realized that, yeah, Jesus was enough for her. Then and there, she trusted Christ as her Savior, and her life was wonderfully transformed. Because she realized that nothing else really mattered. All she needed to know is that Jesus was enough for her. Whatever he had for her, wherever he was going to place her, whatever he was going to give her, was enough. Amen. And I think sometimes in our life, we think we've got to give up so much for him. You don't. Your menial life, which he's already given his son for you. And think about that. Is Jesus enough for you? 
That's the power that Christ has available to us this morning, no matter where we are. You know, we could be believers for 30, 40 years, but I still don't have enough of him. I want more of him. And these are great days to be alive, I think. We have nothing to fear from the Antichrist and his evil plans in, 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 for the world. It's the Lord that we should be delivered from the wrath to come. I just hold on to Christ. And is he enough for you? As we stand, I want to sing this, this, this hymn. Because I want you to realize that how much God loves you. And he loves you so much that he gave his son. He sacrificed his son for you. So we wouldn't have to go through all this pain and all these things that we're talking about. That we can